I knew what it was, I guessed. So you can give me one if you want. Let me give you one. Hey, flow with it. This one's pretty pretty. I do. It's just me. Just me here today. It's hard to do all of it. I hate it. I'm just sick. I'm sick of me. You know? Well, it, it just. The process grinds you down after a while. And well, it's. There's, you know, when you can work on a team, there's like centers. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't yeah. Want, I don't want to be boss. I don't want to run Mm hmm. I feel that. I'm getting old, man. I spent about five years being a boss, and nah, that's enough for me. Oh, we got to we start in one minute. We do, indeed. Man, it went quick. I assume he's going to cue us or something. <coughs> Starting that first one pretty quick. I like it. Oh, really? oh, yeah. I like it. I keep thinking of uh, Little Lion Man on this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think that first, having that first song be up tempo is good. Yeah. <clears throat> of course, then you come to the melody, it kind of slows down. So. Mm -hmm. Well, the audience is tricky. It has, indeed. <laughs>
Good morning and welcome to Watkins United Methodist Church. I'm not John, he's, uh, he's off today, so I'm, I'm filling in. If you would, please stand with us as we sing. Great unknown, my feet way fall, and there you find an end of mystery, the ocean's deep, my faith will stand, and I will call upon your name. Keep my eyes above the waves When oceans rise My soul will rest in your embrace For I am yours You are mine Grace abounds the deepest water, sovereign hand will be my guide. Be me fell as fear surrounds me, you never fail, and you won't start now. And I will call upon your name. I will call upon your name I Keep my eyes above the waves When oceans rise My soul will rest in your embrace For I am yours You are mine Spirit leads me where my trust is without borders Let me walk upon the waters Wherever you will call me Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander And my faith will be made stronger In the presence of my Savior Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the water wherever you may call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders let me walk upon the water wherever you may call me take me deeper than my feet will ever wander and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior And you above all things 
act justly the mercy walk humbly with you God in all things in all ways walk humbly with you God and all comes down to this to be your hands and feet good news to all the world the truth will set us free act justly love mercy walk humbly with you God in all things in all ways walk humbly with you God beauty and ashes morning to dance is closer and closer the kingdom of heaven beauty for ashes morning to dance closer and closer the kingdom of heaven tears from now we'll see the fruit our hands have sown faith just like a seed the only way it grows act justly love mercy walk humbly with you god act justly love mercy with you god Almost. The Spirit was moving over the water. The Spirit, come rest over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, the Spirit moved over us. Come rest on us, come rest on us, come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you through the room, you're here and I know that you're moving. I'm here and I know that. Sing it. Come down, Spirit, when you make my heart pound. When you through the room, you're here and I know that you're moving. I'm here and I know that you feel me. Fire, do it again. Get let heaven on in. Come rest on us. Come rest on us, fire and do it again. Open up the gates, let heaven on in. Come rest on us, come rest on us. Come down, spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know that you're moving. I'm here and I know that you feel me come down. Spirit, would you move you make my heart pound when you fill the room? I'm here and I know that you're moving. I'm here and I know that you feel me. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all I want, you're all we want. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want, you're all we want. One more time. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want, you're all we want. Break it down now. Come down, spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here, and I know that you're moving. I'm here, and I know that you feel me. Come down, spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. 
when you fill the room I'm here and I know that you're moving You're here and I know that you feel me Welcome to Watkins United Methodist Church, whether you are joining us here in person or joining us online, we are just uh, grateful for your presence here in this place. If you are new with us in person or have a prayer request to submit to your pastors, staff, or church family, there are connect cards in your pews in front of you. Um, one side is for connection. If you ha have changed addresses or phone numbers or anything else in the church system, you'd like to be updated. This is a great way to do that. And on the other side, there are prayer requests. And also, below the prayer requests, you may have not seen this before, but there's connection pieces. And so if you'd like to make a decision on some sorts, if you'd like to have a conversation about being connected with Jesus, baptism, connecting with others, serving, um, that's also on this piece of paper. And so if you'd like to get connected this fall, this is a great avenue to start the conversation. You can come talk to us in person, or you could submit this, right? And you'll get us in person later on. Um, but I encourage you to fill this out for us. Now you go to God in prayer with me. We pray. Gracious God, we are grateful. We are grateful that you are here in this place, that you are moving amongst us as we have just lifted up in song. And so, God, we ask that this time of worship would honor you, that we would be able to let go of other distractions that we may have brought in here with us, that you may be able to let us go of all the, the things that we may have brought that we just need to lay at your feet. God, may this be the time to do so. And so, God, as we continue in worship, may you speak. May you move. May you flood our hearts and minds by the power of your love. That we may find ourselves in a different kind of a journey than we did the day before. We ask all of this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ and all God's beloved children said, Amen. I encourage you now to stand your able and greet each other in the name of Jesus Christ. If you are online with us, be sure to hit the comment section and let us know you're here.
Good morning. Okay, man, every week. Okay, we're going to try one more time. Okay, so whenever at the end of morning, I need you all to yell as loud as possible. This is adult participation, too. This isn't just youth or children. Okay, you all ready? Okay. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. Thank you. Okay, I have two volunteers up here. Well, maybe not volunteers. I asked them, like, last second. But this is Lorena right here and her friend Rosie, and they're coming to help me with children's moments today. My name is Colin Higgs, and again, I'm blessed to be the children's and youth pastor. So while I'm giving this announcement, I'd like to invite all my kiddos forward to come up for children's moment. So my, my one announcement this week is we are heading to Agape Wilderness Retreat Center this weekend for our youth. And so this is going to be our chance to put down our phones, open up our Bibles, open up in nature, and to engage God in a, a different way. And so we're excited to partner with Middletown on that. And so if if you need more information or need to discuss any details, please come find me after church. I'd love to talk to you about that. Okay, kids, before we get into our children's moment, I have an activity we're going to do real quick. We're going to practice something. So whenever I say the word cheeseburger, whenever I'm up here, you all need to race as fast as possible to Chris Krause applesauce onto the dark blue spot, okay? So I'm going to try talking to my friends over here, and then you have to listen for the word cheeseburger and then sit down as quick as possible facing that way. Y'all ready? Okay, so I had a really good week this week when I went back to school. Cheeseburgers! Lily, you're over right there. You're not going to do it? You're just going to sit right there? Awesome. Okay, you all can get back up now. Okay, good job, good job. Okay, we're going to keep doing this every week because I really like cheeseburgers. I love hearing about it in worship. Okay, so my friends, Lorena and Rosie are up here to play a game, and it's, we're going to play true or false. So I'm going to have Lorena be truth over here, and then Rosie, if you can come all the way over here, you're going to be my false. So Lorena, you're going to step a little bit further that way. A little bit more, as far away from me as possible. No, I'm just kidding. No, right there, all right. It's perfect. Okay, so our game, kiddos, is today I'm going to ask you a question or a statement. I want you to decide if it is true or false, okay? So the sky is blue. And then if I say the sky is blue, you're going to run to Lorena if you think it's true. And then if not, you're going to run to Rosie if you think it's false. Okay, good start, good start. Okay, first question. Can penguins... Smell toothpaste from miles away. True or false? Y'all, are you sure? Positive. Okay, you guys are right. Okay, next question. Come back in the middle. Come back in the middle. 50 years ago, M&Ms were candy-coated peas during a chocolate shortage. So there, it was peas instead of chocolate. True or False. I got a thinker in the middle here. Oh. <laughs> you got five seconds. Five, four, three, two. And false was correct again. Oh, okay, good job. I don't know. They were not peas. Okay, third one. Okay, this is a little bit trickier. Do you all know what a violin is? No. No? Okay, it's like a, a chin guitar. Go, wah, nah, nah. Okay. <laughs> you know what it is now? Okay. A violin contains 70 pieces of wood. True or false? Leo, she's not going to tell you the answer. <laughs> okay, y'all settled over there? Elliot says true, thank you. And Elliot is right, it is true. 70 pieces of wood. Okay, come back to the middle. We got one, or we got two more questions, actually. Okay, the people of Ireland, that place across the pond, like Thomas the Tank Engine so much that they put faces on all of their trains. True or false? <laughs> you never know they may love Thomas the Tank Engine or they might not <laughs> okay are y'all settled y'all think this is true y'all think this is false which one oh my God. okay and the answer is false okay you guys are doing good okay come back to the middle one last question one last question y'all ready they have square watermelons in Japan because they stack better. True or false? Square-shaped watermelon. Pear-shaped? No, this is, this is a square. Okay, y'all ready? Are you sure? You sure about your answers? No, it's like a square. You stack it. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about that. We'll talk a little bit more about watermelons. Okay, and the answer is true. 
Okay, good job, good job, guys. Okay, now, as we get into our lesson today, I'm going to say cheeseburgers. And then my volunteers can go back to the seats. I know y'all don't like me. Now. Oh, cheeseburgers, we got to stay right there. I love cheeseburgers, but not that much. Okay, so today, Rob is going to talk about a man named Judas, correct? Right? Yeah? Did I listen to the first sermon right? Judas, but a different one than the one I talked about last week. And so he writes a letter to a church, a church that we don't know about, but he's teaching us, say, oh, we got to say cheeseburgers, right where's that? Right there. Okay. We got to stay. We're glued now to where we're at. But today I have a question for you all. Do you all think people in the Bible ever doubted what Jesus said? No. Yes. Why do you say yes, Ellen? Yeah, some people didn't believe in God. You think some people didn't believe in Jesus? Yeah. yeah. How do you think Jesus talked to those people? Kind. Kindly. Awesome. That's a good answer. Truth. Truth. Okay, another really good one. What do you think, Lily? That's Zoe. Zoe. Oh, gosh. Hi, Lily. Neil. Neil. Okay. So today, we're going to talk about Jesus showing kindness, showing mercy and love toward people who have doubts. That instead of harping on them, instead of getting mad at them or encouraging those doubts, that instead that we walk alongside them in this life. And so today in our children's church, we're going to learn to encourage others, to build them up when they're feeling down or they're feeling doubtful, and to show that love instead. Okay, so would you all please put your hands together? Again, adult participation included. Yeah, I'm not seeing a lot of hands together. Adult, adult participation. Yeah, I'm like a teacher. I'm up here. I have the microphone. Okay, adult, okay, and then we're all going to bow our heads. You ready, kids? You've got to put your hands together, bow your heads. Go. Dear Lord, we just invite the Holy Spirit in here today. That as we hear Rob's lesson, as we worship together, as we speak your word, that we find something new, that we learn something, that we delve and we get deeper into you. We just want to pray over these kiddos as they go in the children's church and the kids that aren't here today, that they feel your love and they act on that love and that they reflect you onto our world. And we get to make this world an even more joyful place. In your name we pray, amen. Everyone say amen. Amen. Thank you. Hello. There you go. Okay. Good morning. I'm Julie McCullough. Um, I am going to do the offertory prayer today. So for offertory, um, we have like a Venmo. You can do that. You can go online to our uh, website, or um, we have the offertory that will come through. Um, so if we could have our our ushers come forward, and we'll do a little prayer. Lord God, we just thank you for today, God. Um, on TV this morning, we're reminded of uh, September 11th, and um, just think about that time and remember all those that day that were lost and all those who served that day and the bravery um, of, of many in our country, God. Um, and God, the gifts that they shared uh, that day as you called so many. Um, and Lord God, we thank you for our gifts today, and we pray that um, we just move um, as you um, call us in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Where are you now when darkness seems to win? Where are you now when the world is crumbling? Oh, I, I, I hear you 
same I hear you say Look up Hey Look up child Hey Where are you now Where all I feel is doubt Where are you now I can't figure it out I, I, I hear you say Today we are, are starting a new series called Faith After Doubt. You'll see it on the slides in front of you and on your, uh, your bulletins this morning. Faith After Doubt is, will be a, a four-week series upon what does it mean to have faith in doubt. Sounds simple, doesn't it? What does it mean for two things that seem like they may be opposite in our minds or, or, or aggressive to each other? What does it mean to not be something to be conquered but dancing companions along the way? So that's what we'll be studying for the next couple of weeks. Um, it is loosely based upon, uh, this book will be my main illustration. This is called Faith After Doubt by Brian McLaren, a fantastic book um, that we'll also be studying on Wednesday night starting this Wednesday. And so Wednesday night at Watkins will start this Wednesday with dinner at 6 and then um, classes, small groups at 6.30, bell choir, and then 7.30, regular choir for a traditional service. But I do invite you, even if you are not planning on coming to the class, to pick up the book. It's a fantastic read that's full of great stories of folks experiencing doubt. And, and how do they deal with it? How do they enter into it? We'll touch just a little bit on that. We'll mainly be focusing on biblical characters on Sunday mornings and then the book on Wednesday nights. If you do plan on coming Wednesday night, um, all you have to do is read the introduction, if you like, to this book. That would make you an A-plus student. Right? I was never an A-plus student, sorry to let you down, but um, I was around the B-range kind of student. But if you'd like to get extra credit in A-plus, read the introduction, and if not, that's A-okay. You don't need to, but that'll be where our starting point will be Wednesday nights. Faith After Doubt will be a fantastic time for us, and what we'll be studying on, Wednesday, on Sunday morning as well during the sermon time. So before we open up um, God's word for us today, let us go to God in prayer. Will you pray? Gracious God, we're grateful. We're grateful that no matter who you, we are, you are there. No matter where we may find ourselves, that you are there. And no matter what we may ask for, you hear us. And so God, as we enter into a, a biblical story for us, as we enter into a, a, a scriptural imagination, God, may you speak into our lives. May you continue to breathe something new into our bones. And may you come to elevate all that we may think about to ways that come close to you. We ask all of this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, all God's beloved children said, amen. 
So today we'll be looking at the book of Jude. The book of Jude is towards the end of the New Testament. Um, you may or may not have heard of it. I mean, it's right at the end. It is a whole whopping one chapter long, right? Pretty big book, pretty big book. So an easy one for you to study. If you'd like to read it afterwards, go to lunch, take your Sunday afternoon nap. I'll be doing those things as well. And then you can read it, right? About 25 verses, a fantastic book. Um, We will just be focusing on two verses today. So Jude, I don't even need to put chapter one, do I? But I did. Um, So you didn't think we're going to read two chapters of the book. Um, But Jude, the first chapter and only chapter, verses 20 through 22. It says this, But you, dear friends, build each other up on the foundation of your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep each other in the love of God. Wait For the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will give you eternal life, have mercy on those who doubt. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, how are you with doubt? What is your history with doubt? How was it maybe when you were growing up as a child? How was it kind of spoken about in your household? Maybe how is it spoken about in your household now? How was it maybe when you went to school, how was doubt kind of talked about? And what I'm particularly interested, of course, as a pastor, is how faith communities speak about doubt. So what is doubt? Doubt. So Oxford Dictionary describes it as this. Um, Doubt is a feeling of uncertainty or lack of conviction. A feeling of uncertainty or a lack of conviction. That's how Oxford would describe doubt. You know, I I think as we think about this, that there is a whole spectrum of doubt. There's a spectrum of doubt. That there are some of us who are born natural doubters. Any natural doubters out there? Born natural doubters. They doubt everything. They're uncertain about everything. They don't trust anything that anyone says, right? These are going to be the folks that if you say a fact out loud, they're going to go to their most trusted friend who is Google, amen, right? They'll go straight to Google, they'll look it up. I am this way. I put myself on this side of the spectrum, that I am going to doubt everything that comes out of everyone's mouth. Not because of who you are, of course, but just because that's who I'm wired to be. So I'll go on there, whether right there in front of you, or maybe I'll be polite and wait for a few minutes, right? And then look it up. Is that true? You know, there are also uh, folks, if they're on this spectrum of doubt, who are natural doubters, they typically ask a lot of questions. They question everything you may have said about a story, about a factoid that you may have. You can't make it through a full sentence without them asking the great question, really? You can state the most obvious fact, like the earth is round, and they'll question if it really is and dive into it from themselves. So there's folks who, who doubt everything. I have a lot of questions who don't take anything really for granted. Then, on the other side of the spectrum, I believe those are people who really don't doubt anything. Anybody on that, on that side, right? They don't really doubt anything. They have faith in what is being presented in front of them. Some folks, now on the other side, may say that this group is a little gullible on this side, but that's not a bad thing at the end of the day either. Right? They believe that whatever, let's just for an instance, get their news source, right? they'll believe what they're saying is truth. That they would have no reason to question why they're saying what they're saying. They don't doubt anybody that may have an influence over them, whether it's their, their parents they look up to, or, or maybe their teachers, or maybe even their pastors or their Sunday school teachers. They wouldn't need to do research on it because they believe what is being presented for them, and they just take it as truth. People who I believe are are naturally natural born doubters and folks who who just have a tremendous amount of faith. Now most of us would find us find ourselves somewhere in the middle. Somewhere maybe we may lean more comfortably the one side and the other side, but we find ourselves somewhere in the middle, but we may not find ourselves at the extremes. You know it's interesting to me is the way that faith communities deal with doubt. And, and I'm talking not just Christianity in general or our kind of flavor of Christianity. I would say other religions as well. It is very fascinating to me how religious institutions deal with doubt in their communities. 
You see, faith communities have a complicated relationship with that. Why? Well, faith communities are made up of people, right? Made up of people who are all over that spectrum of doubt and faith. And of course, that would make it as complicated as a person is to describe where an institution is on faith and doubt. You'll find some faith communities, some denominations, some local churches condemn strongly the aspect of doubt in the Christian faith. Do you know those folks? Have you experienced that? They would maybe view doubt more as a weakness inside of a person or maybe even a deterrent from your faith. Do you know folks like that or maybe other places? Sure. You know, this is the side of the spectrum which I would say this is where my faith community growing up found themselves. That doubt was not something to be encouraged, but doubt was something to maybe try to steer far away from, right? Doubt was particularly an evil thought that was planted within you by the devil to take you away from God. Have you heard that version before? Sure. And that's a fact amongst them. But what can you doubt? Well, there's a whole plethora of things that you can't doubt in certain religious institutions, much like that denomination local church I found myself in. So the first is there is no no place for doubt when it comes to the Holy Scriptures called the Bible. Right? There's no doubt in that. Their belief system was that each word was dictated verbally, word by word, to a person who wrote down word for word what God wanted them to say. There's no room for doubt there. Now, you could question some translations that could lead you astray. We were only allowed to read one translation. That translation was the King James Version of the Bible, right? And whatever was found in the King James Version of the Bible was what was truth, right? And everything else was not God-ordained. I remember people in in that local church where I grew up, I'm very grateful for them, would have the bumper stickers that said, if it's not KJV, it's not for me, right? That would be where they would find truth. And that truth is not to be questioned. Now, they have other places in which there's no room for doubt. We would call those things doctrine, right? Doctrines of the church are, are, are belief systems of a sort. Um, and where you, know, you would not be able to exercise any sort of doubt besides what that particular church believed. And I don't believe, now that I've learned more and more from, from other kind of faith institutions, this is just a Christian thing or a Southern Christian thing. I think this is just a thing that you may find. So you not have doubt and inerrancy of Scripture. That's what I was just talking about. You can't doubt that each word wasn't dictated word for word by God. No mistakes, no error. Now, if you look at the Greek and the Hebrew, maybe you could have an argument with the King James Version only, right? God speaks in Old English, right? That would be maybe the section up there. There would also be other belief systems like abortion, like they just cut and dry what they believe in, on, on abortion and why. There's cut and dry on things like human sexuality, right, that there's cut and dry, this is what we believe, and you can't stray or doubt this. Evolution would be another one in which these institutions would say, this is strictly what we believe, and you find yourself outside of the boundaries, you can't belong here. And then political party, they would never say it from the pulpit, sometimes they do. This is the political party that we align ourselves with, you cannot be a Christian if you are, insert the word here. No room. No wiggle room. These are boundaries almost like bumpers that I probably should still use in a a bowling alley, right? To keep you within the doctrine, the theology of the church. And doubt has no room. This is the, the, the denomination, the, the place. This is the kind of worldview in which I kind of grew up in and I remember well, I started to have maybe doubts along the way. I was a, I was a teenager, so of course I'm, I'm a natural doubter, so I question everything. When I was a teenager, whenever I doubted something that the male preacher said from the pulpit or, or in, from the Bible, KJV of course, um, I would feel all the guilt and shame there ever was. I'd feel bad. Maybe I wasn't a good person, bless you. Maybe Jesus couldn't love me if I believed differently from my own church community. You know, this, this, tension, this tension kept me in line for a while, and then there was a time in which it didn't. And for most of us in that faith journey of faith and doubt, there's a place in your time of your life where you decide that, well, I no longer fit within that box in which I find myself. I remember I, I went to Florida Southern College. 
tss, right, home in the moccasins, and, 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 and it was at Florida Southern. I, I was not very smart, and I, I was the first person in my family to go to college, and so we didn't know really what we're doing when we're signing up for classes, and I remember I, I had to do all these kind of intro classes, is what I came into, and I signed up for biology. What I didn't know is I signed up for biology for majors. Um, I was a music education major, as far away as you can get from biology, right, <laughs> for majors. So I signed up for the class, and my worldview changed. And I remember having these conversations within with my professor. They probably thought I was really annoying. And, they, and then I had these conversations with the peers afterwards. They said, do you really believe that, what we just learned? And, and I remember having this struggle when I went back, and, and I was on staff at that, that, that large church before um, in the youth ministry, and I would struggle with the other pastors there and say, hey, I'm learning this. It's not computing. And there was kind of like, well, Robbie, you don't want to stray away from the faith. We told you not to go to that college, right? Um, you needed to stay within the boundary. And then it was at that point that the dam that I have built up to keep in those fundamental truths for me could no longer hold. And the dam broke, and the waters flushed straight through. For most of us, there was that time. For most of us, if we struggled with anything with faith and doubt, we come from a different place. You may have grown up United Methodist, and maybe this was never a conversation for you, although some United Methodists treat Bible and theology this way. that can no longer, longer hold, and the water just rushes through. And my, my, my kind of encouragement for you even this time is that you're not alone in that. You're not alone. It's, it's consistent all throughout scriptures that we hold so dearly, spiritual figures struggling with doubt. It's all throughout church history as we read people struggling with what do I believe and why do I believe. Now, maybe they didn't struggle with biology for majors along the way, but they all wrestle with doubt. But what I've come to believe, what I've come to believe is that they didn't wrestle with doubt, that they became entrenched in a dance with it. You see, the book of Jude is an interesting book of the Bible. One chapter, about 25 verses, give or take. And it's an interesting book that I encourage you to take a read later on. But the author calls himself Jude or Judas, brother of James. And it's most likely that this author is a brother of James and Jesus Christ, who becomes the leader of the church of Jerusalem. So get that. He's the member of the holy family, right? What's so interesting about Jude himself is that he did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah during Jesus' lifetime. He didn't believe it. Your own brother, person that ate with you, was taught by you, who learned all these different sermons and theology, doubted who Jesus was. Someone as close to even Jesus and his disciples and his close friends doubted who Jesus was. Do you get that? Someone with Jesus 24-7. Heard all the different, the different scriptures throughout. Heard it traveled all without and heard him heal and his friends and go to these tremendous measures to show him, hey, I'm God, I'm Messiah. And the, the word became flesh, doubted who Jesus was. So Jude, he wouldn't come to faith in Jesus' Messiah until after Jesus' resurrection and ascension. And then he becomes one of the best missionaries for the gospel. You see, it's in that context of doubt. It's in that context of doubt that the author pens the words in which we read together. We read earlier. I want you to read this with me now. And I want you to keep in context of Jude, the person who was Jesus' brother, his disciple, the person who traveled with him, who doubted who Jesus was, says these words. Let's read this together. But you, dear friends... Build each other up on the foundation of your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep each other in the love of God. Wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will give you eternal life. Have mercy on those who doubt. Mercy on those who doubt. You see, I love this passage, not because it, it reminds me of something. Remember the, 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 the word study that we did a little while ago, right? How the power of words kind of has the same kind of mantras from the Apostle Paul's writings. But I love it. Build each other up. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep each other in love of God. Wait for the mercy. Have mercy on those who doubt. 
You see, throughout the, the, the scripture, if you would read it from the beginning, Jude is arguing. He's in this kind of this fist fight of words with the community going on because they, he feels like there's a lot of false teaching going on. That they're teaching a lot of things that, that just aren't, aren't what it means to follow Jesus. So he's arguing against false teaching. But the thing is, he's arguing against false teaching not because of doctrinal concerns. Not because they don't intellectually understand who Jesus is. They, don't, they can't repeat the creed word for word of what we believe about Jesus. It's not because of this kind of doctrinal orthodoxy argument. It's because he has a lot of moral concerns. Moral concerns. You see, there's a big difference there, isn't there? Against a fight for orthodoxy or right teaching, just for uh, kind of intellectual assent. But there's also a fight for right teachings because it this is what it looks like to be a loving human being. This is what it means to, to follow Jesus. It, it affects our behavior. It affects how we treat one another. So how, how do we treat one another? How, how do we do that? Well, we saw it. But dear friends, build each other up. We read this before, a foundation of the most Holy Spirit. Pray in the Holy Spirit. That sounds really great. How, wait for the mercy of Lord Jesus. Oh, yeah, how do we do this? There's one verse that comes afterwards. Have mercy on those who doubt. I, I, I find words to be interesting. I find words to be interesting. I, this past week, I was in Durham, North Carolina. I, I was serving. I'm now on the National Alumni Council for Duke Divinity School. So if you thought I was done talking about Duke, no chance. Sorry, I apologize. Um, they, so I serve on this three-year term. I meet with professors. It's a small group of 10 of us from around the country who meet with professors and the dean. It's, it's really, really neat. And I, I, I really don't belong there because everybody else was way smarter and cooler than I am. But it was cool to just sit in the room. But we met with, El, uh, with Ellen Davis. Ellen Davis is a professor of Old Testament. She's brilliant. She's like the person that would come up and she would have the Hebrew scriptures in front of us and she would translate it off the cuff, right? So she would read it in Hebrew and say, oh, this is what it means. It was a live translation. I mean, in incredibly brilliant. I'm not on that level whatsoever. Um, but she has this kind of whole idealism of what it means to have the power of words. That we should dive into original words because original words matter. Because there's a context. There's a, a reason why it's written this way. That there is implications for it that not just happened back then, but for us now. And she talks about always going back to the word bank and going back to the origin of words. And I love hearing where they come from, the implications, and I think that I picked that up from her. But the Oxford Dictionary defines mercy as this, and I find this interesting. Mercy is defined as compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish or harm. Mercy. Compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish or harm. Think about this in terms of, of what we just read. Think about this in terms of what we would have. Have, have, have. have mercy on those who doubt. Have compassion on those who doubt. Forgive those who doubt. Yes, you may be certain of all the things in the world. You may have your life together way more than I do. You may have more Bible passages memorized than, than your neighbor. You may, you may have the creeds figured out. You may have uh, the Trinity. You've figured it out. You've got the equation down. We've argued about it for thousands of years, but you got it, right? Have compassion on those who doubt. Have mercy on those who doubt. Why? It's not just because it makes us a better human being, which I truly believe that. But you may find yourself in the same space as your neighbor. Brian McLaren takes it a next step further in his book just in the beginning. And he says, we not, are not just called as Christians to have mercy on those who doubt, but have compassion and encouragement even for ourselves. Now, I first met Brian, I think it was 2015 or 2014. I was a new pastor out of Duke Divinity School, and I had been appointed. I had no idea, still have no idea what I'm, what I'm doing. And I met him at this little church plant in Deland, Florida. 
The land at that point wasn't as built up as it is now. Maybe you've heard of it. Stetson University is there. Uh, the good kind of Baptist. Not there's bad kind of Baptist. The Baptists are up there. Um, and, and, and anyways, it was this downtown church plant in, in DeLand, Florida. And he had just written this kind of new way of being Christian. Uh, it's called The Great Spiritual Migration. It's a fantastic book. If you're looking for, hey, what do I do now? My life has changed. Doubts are embraced. What do I do? And it got me hooked on the way that he talked about things like faith justice, love, and doubt ever since then. And that's the book we'll be using. But McLaren, at the, right at the beginning of the book, he, you know, the, sometimes in the beginnings of books, they start to write things, and they quote other people, kind of kick off the book, right? You've seen those, like beginnings of chapters. He chooses to quote um, something from, from another great author. And his name's Paul Tillich. Have you heard Paul Tillich before? Paul Tillich is a, is a German theologian. He, uh, when I, I took a class basically on, on Tillich 101 when I was an undergrad, there's this great story about Germans, um, particularly in that time, would imbibe on certain things pretty heavily, right? Yeah, pretty well known. And he is a great theologian who, who also imbibed pretty well. And he was sitting around in a classroom and people were asking him about his writings and were like, you know, uh, Professor Tillich, explain to us what you meant by this. And, and Tillich would say, well, you know, when I wrote this, only two people knew what I was talking about. God and, and me, and now only God knows. <laughs> it's a great quote. It's a great quote. But anyways, he, he, uh, a great th- German theologian, he, he starts out, uh, Brian starts out his book saying this um, from Paul Tillich. It says this, and I think it's beautiful. Doubt isn't the opposite of faith. It is an element of faith. Sometimes I think it is my mission to bring faith to the faithless and doubt to the faith. The great theologian of the church. Doubt is in the opposite of faith. It is an element of faith. Sometimes I think it is my mission to bring faith to the faithless and doubt to the faith. Why would he start out this way? Why would Paul Tillich say these, these words? Well, doubt is necessary for the Christian journey. You may think it's crazy that a Christian preacher is telling you to doubt things, but I'm encouraging you to do so. It can be scary, sure. It can be a little bit jarring to our worldviews, absolutely. It can be a little bit disorienting along your way. But doubt, I believe, is the dancing partner to faith. It is what transitions our given faith, given from others to our own faith. It is what oils the machine. It's what catapults us into a deeper way of living. You see, my argument and my belief system is that doubt is not an enemy to be conquered, but a great companion for our journey. Not an enemy to be conquered, but the great companion for our journey. This is what we'll be talking about for the next few weeks. So go ahead. Be a little dangerous. Doubt. You have my full permission. Not that you needed it. Ask good questions. Dive into the biblical text a little bit deeper than you did the day before. Challenge some assumptions you may have held for quite a while. And if they're good, if they're true, if they're beautiful, they'll always come back. But hang on. It can be a transformational journey. Will you pray with me about that? Oh, God, sometimes we don't know what we are doing here. Sometimes we we find ourselves in a a place of complacency. Sometimes we find ourselves on a road that we don't know where it's leading us towards. Help us, oh God, to be our great guide and companion. Help us to dive deeper into what we believe and why in the world do we believe it. Not for the sake of intellectual ascent or even the sake of orthodoxy. But for sake of living a life worth living. Of finding things like justice and compassion and love because that is the way of Jesus. Help us, O oh God. Be with us, O oh God. And I call this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ and all God's beloved children said. Amen.
Please stand with me as we sing. When darkness tries to roll over my bones, when sorrow comes, it's still the joy I own. When brokenness and pain is all I know, I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing in your has a place to hide I am not afraid to the lies I'm not afraid to leave the place behind I won't be shaken I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm Stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing in your love. This time will that break ever change. This power that can put the out the grave. There's resurrection power that can save There's power in your name My fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I Stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Standing in your love. Thank you, Ben. One announcement for your release back out into this world to release love. Um, we are starting Wednesday nights back, as I've said before. So we are going to be eating meals three times a semester. We're going to give that a shot, see how it goes. And so, but we ask that you would reserve um, so that we know how many people to expect. Um, and so there are, are, if you're old school, sheets of paper out there that you're welcome to sign up on. There's also a QR code to scan to fill out a little form too to tell us you're coming and how many people are coming with you. If you'd like to tear down or set up, there's also information about that. Um, we are going to give it a shot. Then in 6.30, there'll be programming for all ages. So children and youth will have different kinds of small groups and activities on Wednesday nights. Um, and then adults, although children and youth are welcome to come to my class on um, Faith After Doubt for the first. And then there's going to be a, a more intensive uh, uh, study on the book of Revelation for today. That's also really good. So I'm splitting it up two different five-week classes. So come join us. Everyone is welcome. You don't need to be a member of Watkins to eat or to fellowship with us. Um, we do encourage you to come and, and to reconnect, re-engage with both Scripture and other human beings in a Christian community. So we encourage you to do that. Now receive this benediction. Now go in the name and the power of Jesus Christ to know that there is no place that Jesus is not, that there is no journey that Christ is not there with you, guiding you, walking with you, that leads to faith, doubt, and love. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace and peace, my friends. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing in your love, standing in your